ritual is the same. Six, sometimes seven days a week, a walk down five flights of stairs from his Canal Street apartment in Manhattan, a subway ride to Long Island City. Maybe check out the sports page to see, depending on the season, how the Knicks, Yankees, or Pittsburgh Steelers made out. Artists are like rats and mice, Romare Bearden has said. They're best off in places like old houses where there aren't any traps laid for them. There are no traps here, not even a telephone. It is a safe place for an artist to explore his own self, to explore the possibilities of color and form, to conjure images of things remembered and things never seen. Bearden wrote in his book, The Painter's Mind, that many people, whether they realize it or not, believe that the art experience is the same as the life experience. But it isn't the artist, he wrote. It's the work that reveals the truth in art. Like the jazz musicians that defined his growing up in Harlem and whose attitudes are so closely related to his own work, Bearden is an improviser. He says that he never starts a collage with an idea, but gets his ideas from the work. We're only worth what we find. What we're looking for isn't worth a damn, he maintains. The ideas then that he's found and the skill with which he expresses them have caused Bearden to be regarded as one of America's greatest living artists. Young Bearden was so filled with the poetry of the time, so thrilled by the music, so stirred by the arts, that he began his, his first career as a lyric writer. And then as a cartoonist, copying after E. Sims Campbell. When I uh, first became interested in art, it was with cartoons. And I copied, you know, Mutt and Jeff and the Cats and Jammer kids, as most children do when they become interested in trying to draw. And uh, later, uh, when I, I wanted to, you know, further my knowledge of art, I went to the Art Students League and I studied with the late master, George Groats. And Groats used to say to me, well, Romy, you must have been doing a lot of cartoons because most of the students, you know, are very careful about how they draw and they're uh, are very tight, but you just slash all over the paper. You must, so I said, I want you to really observe something. Uh, because to break out of the habit that you have of just slapdash and maybe just draw a foot or a hand or a face over the full paper and really try to observe something. So this is uh, what I did uh, first in Groats, uh, to get myself really to looking at things and observing life. During the Depression, Bearden worked for the city from 9 to 5 and painted in the evenings at his studio on 125th Street. One night, leaving the studio with the poet Claude McKay, they were greeted with the sound of keys jangling, the calling card of ladies of pleasure in that day. Bearden turned and saw the homeliest woman he'd ever seen. Gentlemen, two dollars. Then she said, a dollar. And then, 50 cents? A quarter? And finally she said, for God's sake, just take me. Bearden just looked at her and said, Lady, you are in the wrong profession. He felt such pathos that he went home to his mother and asked her to find this homely woman a job. His mother, Bessie Bearden, was a political and social force in Harlem and knew everyone from Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary Bethune to Duke Ellington and Fats Waller. Bessie found the woman a job. The woman's name was Ida, and she felt she owed Bearden so she would come and clean his studio every Saturday. In the studio was his easel with an unmarked piece of brown paper on it. Bearden just wasn't painting. Ida would see this brown paper week after week. One day she asked, Romy, is this the same brown paper I saw last week and those weeks before? And Bearden said, yes, I'm trying to get my ideas together. Well, why don't you paint me, she asked. And she knew by the way he looked at her, what he was thinking. It was the same look that had answered her jangling keys. Still, she said, you know, you told me I was in the wrong profession. Well, I got news for you. I know what I look like. But when you can look into me and find what is beautiful, 
That's when you'll be able to put something on that paper of yours. Bearden never did paint Ida, but believes that her statement was the greatest lesson in art he's ever had. He's been painting seriously for some 45 years now, and his work is in major museums both here and abroad. In 1971, the Museum of Modern Art gave him a one-man retrospective. In October of 1980, a retrospective of his work over the last decade will open at the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, his birthplace. He's received the Frederick Douglass Award from the Urban League and the James Weldon Johnson Award from the NAACP. He's written books on aesthetics and the history of black American painters. He's a founder of the Cinque Gallery, which promotes young minority artists. Organized museum exhibits. Designed the sets and costumes for plays and ballets. He has even written a hit song. More than once, he and his wife, Nanette, have been awoken at seven on a Sunday morning by a young artist seeking advice. And while he enjoys the publicity and the recognition, the truth of Romare Bearden lies in what he creates with scissors and colored paper, with magazine cutouts and paint and glue. I think all the time about how wonderful it is that Romy's alive and that he, he paints for us because what I can do with language in, in terms of giving us uh, access to dreams and mythology and the kinds of visions that come from the soil that we grew on, I can see whenever I go see something that Romy has painted or put together as a collage. It's as if, if I said that a woman had butterflies in her cheeks, I don't have to say it because I can go find a bearded person who, in fact, has butterflies coming out of her ears or her nose or through her window there are phantoms coming who are her lovers and it's just wonderful. He uses a technique that's almost like photography or film. He uses, when he takes things out of magazines, these are all shot from different vanishing points. And so that what you get in the final assemblage or collage is many different faceted viewpoints. In other words, you're seeing it from many sides at once, almost as though it were the cubism was re reinvented. It's as though you were walking around the entire scene, not just one figure. You also have the feeling of immediacy uh, the split screen, the close-up, uh, slow motion, uh, all of that is in, are in these collages, at least to me. Uh, you also have the feeling that what we all get from modern uh, uh, film techniques, or at least in television, we get the feeling of instant replay, and that that immediacy, when, I, when he paints, a, uh, when he puts together these uh, assemblages, collages of a cotton fields of North Carolina, you feel that you're there. prevalence of ritual. This is what Bearden is about. A girl stands in a blue pond, silhouetted by a cypress moon, watched by birds, journeying things, Bearden calls them. Roosters, horses, trains, moonrise and sunset. Women that work the soil and walk naked through magical forests blue snakes that dance, conjure women that are linked to the ancient mysteries. See through your eyes, not with them. Every man carries within himself a world made up of all that he has ever seen and loved, and it is to this world that Bearden constantly returns in his southern paintings. It is a world of mythical overtones, a world where daily gestures assume the ritualistic.
What is it? I'm trying really to remember. The clock has stopped. Now I can never know where the edge of my world can be. If I could only enter that old calendar that opens to an old, old July and learn what unknowing things know.
it's a wonderful thing to be able to look at a two-dimensional plane or experience the first time a young boy ever went into the swamps to fish or to look for crabs or to climb trees where there had never been anybody but black people walking. And Romy can allow us to have all those things if we looked at the work, say, for the last 30 years. But when I see Romy's things, I see all the stories I had ever heard almost all at once, and it's not confusing because we don't remember things chronologically. And Romy at least has the courage to present to us a mythology that's not narrative. He presents us a mythology that is present and actual, as well as being our dream life. And it's, it's, it's uh, very, very rich for those of us who weren't born in the South, but have been raised on tales of the South. It's as if the stories we were weaned on become actual, and we can have them again as adults. And I can offer them to my children, who may never hear the same kinds of drawls or the same kinds of music that I heard in the United States ever again. When I uh, first began to do collages, I had no idea that I was going to develop certain symbols that have run through my work, like the train, the serpent, the guitar. But these were all natural things that I saw in the life around Mecklenburg County in North Carolina. And so much of that uh, life that I lived as a young boy has informed my work. And I think it's best when you first begin to work at art or to be thwarted a bit so that all your energies are dammed up. And then when you begin to break through something, uh, these energies are released. And just like running water, you shouldn't dam it up or it won't be running water anymore. It has to flow. And the symbols that I've used, the serpent, the guitar, not necessarily mean anything to anyone else, nor did the water lilies or the facades of cathedral mean anything except to Monet. And uh, so it is with the uh, symbols that I use. I use the train because so many of the lives of black people had to do with the train. So these are the, are the elements of my environment. The black woman, which I tried to relate uh, to the, uh, the African art of Benin, uh, the uh, rituals of bathing, and I've often used this because it is an ancient ritual, and this is what I have tried to do uh, in my uh, collages, uh, to uh, bring uh, the Afro-American experience into art and give it a universal dimension. Bearden's uh, development as an artist between his, uh, in his rural pictures to his uh, sophisticated pictures in Harlem are quite extraordinary. Uh, he, he responded always to what was happening. In his early pictures from the, uh, the, the, the nudes and the uh, fields and the trains of, uh, of the South, uh, they had a certain serenity. There wasn't as much diffusion in the composition. Uh, again, because that's, that was the, the, the roots were simpler. I mean, there was a very, you, the, everything that happened in the South had a more of an order to it. And these pictures have that order. Uh, as he moved uh, into Harlem with all of the excitement that was going on in the uh, 40s, 30s, and 40s in Harlem, and the music, that came, and the tenements, the light that comes down a city street, uh, the, uh, the sunset between two buildings, uh, the, the light changes enormously in his pictures, and the syncopation of his compositions are changed. Uh, the, the frenetic quality enters.
Some people have looked at Bearden's work and thought it to be surrealistic. But these were things that were around him all the time, the things he saw every day. The people, the music, the dancing. To Bearden, the people of Harlem are models that are as great as Latrax. I think the artist has to be something like a whale, Bearden said, swimming with his mouth wide open, absorbing everything until he has what he really needs. When he finds that, he can start to make limitations, and then he really begins to grow. Another aspect of Bearden's work that is extremely important is the priority he gives to uh, human beings, to human beings in their suffering, to human beings in their joy, to human beings in their states of reflection, contemplation, and repose. And by choosing his human subjects, by giving them the foreground, he has created a series of works over a long period of time in varying styles which constitute an affirmation of the human experience and which constitute a statement of his commitment for art as a contribution to the life of people rather than as a mere reflection of that life or as something to be imposed upon to embellish that life. Now particularly in dealing with subjects of the life in the black world in the uh, modern cities, there is a tendency to accent the sociological aspect. And this short circuits the experience of the human depths that are before us. And uh, this is a barrier that I find uh, Bearden has uh, completely eliminated. What he has, is presenting to us are human beings in a certain social condition. He's not talking about the social condition. He's talking about the humanity and the uh, wonder of it that is there before us. When we were here in 1971, and I decided to do that uh, the scene over there and make it into the block, there was a funeral. And I, I guess we talked about that time of the processing of actuality into uh, an aesthetic statement. You remember? Right. The creative process is just that. It's a matter of processing raw material into a statement which is aesthetic. It's not a matter of reporting or recording because ultimately the, uh, the statement which you're going to make uh, has to do with the life of human feeling. It does how it feels to be a human being. It's, it's concerned with rendering that in terms of aesthetic statement. And uh, a lot of people uh, get so geared to representational art or figurative art uh, that they think that you're making a report and they're gonna look at a page and say, yeah, that looks just like it. Well, even when it does look just like it, it is really talking about something other than that or at any rate, something more than what you see. You yes, agree? you know, in the, uh, those great German paintings of Dura, Cranach, seemingly very lifelike, mm -hmm. they are in actuality 
a very abstract and great psychological uh, uh, statements about life. In that sense, they're quite abstract. There's, you know, the reality of painting is, a, or the reality of any art is a whole, a whole different thing from what you just mentioned as the raw material of life. Right. We've got to take and abstract that. So even if you are drawing in a sense very realistically like Ang, you are abstracting right. from, uh, from the actual life of it. So many people, I know you've heard them say, you know, I was driving, I saw this beautiful sunset, and I only wish I could have painted. I would have done a beautiful scene, but that, an artist doesn't think that way. That's right. You know, you've developed your art by looking first at comic uh, books, and Norman Rockwell, and then maybe you stay there, and then maybe you want to go on a little further. But it is uh, made from other art. So in dealing with the block, for example, as suggestive as it is of the block, the statement is about something more than the block. That's you right. Say? You know, we looked at this was just a jumping off point when we did, uh, the, you know, the liquor store and was the funeral, and I made it like Ethiopian uh, angels or something up there receiving the lady. Mm -hmm. You remember I did a drawing out there, uh, Al, of the, uh, but uh, just something like this was enough to get me started, you know, on what I later did. You know, the funeral parlor right, right there, there was right. a funeral going on at that time. I guess the guy's very busy. And then I imagined, let's say there was a family eating, a little boy up there, and I put the big electric light bulb mm -hmm. and the other figures in sitting around eating, and then we went inside of the building. A lot of people think that you see that and then you have the painting in mind, but you actually feel the painting by taking the options as they open up, as you play with, as you oh, improvise. It's exactly. an improvised painting. That's, a, that's exactly. I just, it, just this little note was enough. But looking at those buildings now, Al, look at this. Mm -hmm. See that one, those two red ones? Right. And this one a little longer. This one coming back to here. Actually, what we, what I'm doing here is making a keyboard. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that we have to think about here is interval. Mm -hmm. See, if this is dark, mm -hmm. you remember we have this big light area, and this is another one, and maybe the things up here, that we're already defining this as a musical composition. Right. Do you, do, you, do you understand what exactly. I mean? Moving from one point to the other. And this is the basis of, and then you have to look for things that repeat themselves, like those uh, chimneys. Mm -hmm. You see, going along and you move your repetition. And then you see these triangular movements uh -huh. that you get these in. And then the first thing you know, you have a sonata. Transformations, a poem by Nick Lyons for Romare Bearden. How do you get from ghetto to sparrow, from ritual to phase, unblinding, 
these half heads cut by hats, these sewed up faces, conjure women, this fiddling fierce jester, mask, that candle, that super flat hand which has held on blinding. This mystery, how in the corner of a ghetto, a sparrow grows lips and remembers how to sing. One finds, when one turns to the works of Bearden, a black artist using, again, the techniques, the formal art techniques of post-impressionist Europe, uh, finding his own roots and through those, ours also, in and by way of the African forms. <laughs> One thinks of the art of such a, an artist not as black art, not as African art, but as, as human art, because he is rendering it himself, not in the way of uh, this is Africa, but uh, this is man, and uh, conjuring from our own psyches participation in the elementary aspects of the imagery that he presents. The very form carries us into a dimension that is dreamlike and visionary. We're used in our usual rational arts to think of life as the life of the world of waking consciousness. But there's another world. There's the world of dream consciousness that we enter every night in sleep. And there the forms that we see and which frighten us or which delight us are actually manifestations of our own unconscious depths. We are seeing aspects of ourselves of which our conscious life is generally unaware. And the mode of visionary art is the mode of dream. The visions, the forms that you are looking at are of yourself. And uh, I felt there was a, a kind of a new depth of authenticity here in the use of these materials, uh, they are more at home, you might say, in his canvases than they are in those of the European artists using the same forms. After the World War II, I was lived in Paris on the GI Bill of Rights going to the Sorbonne. And one day there was a large funeral. Some general or military man had died. And I was uh, looking at the, uh, you know, the military bands, the soldiers, the cortege going by. And it seemingly, a, they had sent a contingent of soldiers in a band from Spain. 
and they were uh, playing, you know, the, the funeral dirges that you see in the most funerals. And then they wound around a corner, and there was an English gentleman standing behind me, and the Spanish band began to play a flamenco. And you thought of Hannibal crossing the Alps when these trumpets sounded. And the Englishman said to me, now life has taken over, hasn't it? And I think this is something to do with art, because art in its essence celebrates a victory. Ancestral Voices was conceived in 1977 as a dance work when Alvin Ailey asked me to choreograph a work for his company. And at that time, Alvin asked me if I'd like to have Romare Bearden do the sets and costumes. And I was just overwhelmed by the idea because I had a great deal of admiration for this great artist's work. And so that we came together and he did the costumes and the set designs for the work. Uh, the piece was conceived in four sections, the earth section, water, air, and fire. <laughs>
most interesting things about Romy's work is how he has drawn from the experience of the Afro-American in the rural South a uh, sense of the ritual activity, particularly that expressed in what we might call the water experience, the experience of baptism, which was such an important part of a life dominated by the church in the agricultural environment. The baptism took place usually in the hot summer. It was an event to which people looked forward. It was an event which had high dramatic importance in the lives of the community. It was an event in which the persons to be baptized were dressed in white, which was preceded by a long period of emotional and highly charged singing. And so within that framework, this event has a kind of centrality which is very important. I see in Bearden's search for this kind of affirmation in his work and an attempt to bring back into the lives of people some part of that richness which was lost through the uh, abandonment, as it were, through the uh, drifting away from the rural background. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, standing in the way of sinners, sat in the seat of the scornful, but he is delighted in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree that's planted by the river of water, bringing forth his fruits in his season. His, his leaves also shall not wither, but whatsoever thy do shall prosper. But the ungodly is not so, it's like the chariot which the wind drive it away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord know the way of the righteous, but the ungodly, they shall perish. These entire six verses, there's a fountain filled with blood, drawing from Emmanuel vein. <laughs> Romare Bearden's uh, odyssey as an artist is very much like America's odyssey. It goes from rural innocence to urban sophistication. Uh, it's in all of us. It's about a child that never grew up. It's, you can hear it in Billie Holiday. It's that flower-sacked girl who became a sophisticated woman with mascara. <laughs> I think that unless one is able to see the fragility and the beauty that survived the trauma that produces the blues, then one has never seen or heard the blues. And that's, without seeing or hearing the blues, one does not know anything about black people in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the blues, however, has the same kind of piquancy and uh, aura uh, that dawn and sunset have. Uh, and that's why I like what Romy does with it, because 
it's not just a cauldron of hell and hellishness and drinking and, and nightfall that uh, makes us who we are. It's also uh, being able to rejoice and, and accept the triumph of having survived all that absurdity. It was so great a time that we did not sleep. Bearden didn't sleep. We would go to the jam sessions at the, at the Hot Shaw and other places. These were the coffee houses of the Elizabethan days. We would go to work just by taking a shower and changing clothes. The jam sessions and the, and the talk of the famous spurred all of the young people, and it spurred Bearden. When I was a little boy uh, living in 131st Street in Harlem and going uh, to the Lafayette Theater, I might hear Duke Ellington and a blues singer. And she would sing a song like, I woke up this morning and I, my man had left a letter and he was, said he was going to leave me. And if I feel like I do now, I'm going jump in the river. Well, this is a terrible existential thing. As a woman, whose man has left her. She's going to possibly commit suicide. But what was happening behind her? Uh, somebody was riffing, uh, that is, uh, uh, playing something on the trombone. And what, has, what was ostensibly a very terrible thing was becoming a farce. And it's the same, so in that sense, uh, what was happening at the Lafayette Theater uh, has a linkage to ancient Greece. Because if you had these ceremonies of the Vestal Virgins, and the satyrs would come in and start snatching them and running off to the woods with them, uh, something that was very tragic and solemn would turn into a farce. So this is art, it's celebrating its own kind of victory. And I think this is the tradition of which I work out of, that I don't see despair so much as I see man and women's possibility of surmounting it, of trying to certify life. Mm -hmm. 